Low carb diets cause insulin resistance. New study breakdown. What's up guys? We're back with another educational video. And this week we are talking about low carb diets and a new paper that suggests they may cause insulin resistance. <gasps> but first, like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment for the algorithm. FTA all the way, baby. I recently got sent a new paper. Title is kind of provocative. Basically their conclusions were that a low carb diet in lean individuals, so people with normal BLI, so not obese, actually shows worse outcomes with regards to insulin sensitivity and metabolic acidosis. What they did was the researchers found cohorts of people either following low carb, kind of regular carb or high carb diets who were also lean, like a BMI of like around 25. And they looked at their markers of insulin sensitivity, like HOMA IR, pancreatic beta cell function, and C-peptide, which is a marker for insulin production, and a whole host of other things. The results of this study got quite a few people fired up. And in fact, a lot of the anti-low carb crowd sent this to me. And I think a lot of people think I'm anti-low carb because I end up debunking a lot of low carb crazy claims. I am not anti-low carb. In fact, Carbon Diet Coach, our nutritional coaching app, low carb is the only dietary preference that has two different settings. You have regular low carb and you have ketogenic. So I'm not anti-low carb, I'm just anti-crazy claims around low carb. So I dug into this paper a little bit. I was like, oh, that's a little bit weird. What I found, was that it's not as sexy as the title presents and it's not as sexy as all the anti-low carb people are making it out to be. So first off, to be included in the study, you had to be lean as a subject, but also low carb was defined as less than 45% of daily calories from carbohydrate. Now, a lot of people out there would not consider that low carbohydrate. In fact, you know, low carbohydrate, a lot of people synonymously associate with the ketogenic diet, which those are not the same. Ketogenic diet is a very low carb diet. And in the research literature, typically around 40 to 45% of calories from carbohydrate is considered considered low carb. Now, some of you may be upset by this, but the fact remains that that's what the research literature defines it as. And it's hard to get large populations in cohorts who are in very low carb diets, especially who are lean. I understand why they stratified it this way. Regular carb was defined as between 45 and 65% of dietary calories from carbohydrate, which is kind of in line with the government recommendations for carbohydrate intake. And the high carb was above 65% of carbohydrate intake. When we look at the outcomes of the study, there were in fact less favorable outcomes with the low carb group. If we look at their HOMA IR, in the low carb, it was worse than regular carb. Their pancreatic beta cell function was worse in the low carb compared to the regular carb group. And the C their C-peptide was higher in the low carb group versus the regular carb group. All of that kind of suggests like more insulin being released, less insulin sensitivity. But here's the part that didn't get into the headlines. It was the same as the high carb group. So the low carb group and the high carb group had no differences on any of these metrics. So you could actually argue just as easily, the title of this paper should be High Dietary Carbohydrate Intake Negatively Affects Insulin Sensitivity in Lean Individuals. The fact of the matter is, the more balanced diet did have the best outcomes. Now, it wasn't a huge difference. There were statistically significant, but there weren't massive differences in numbers. I do kind of think it's disingenuous for this to be framed as like, well, low carb was worse than regular carb without talking about the other group. What this paper suggests to me is that in this cohort of individuals of lean, normal weight individuals, that a balanced diet is probably better for insulin sensitivity mildly than either a low carb diet or a high carb diet. And I mean, we saw the same thing for fasting glucose. The moderate carb or regular carb group was lower in fasting glucose than the low carb group. It wasn't by a lot, but they were also lower than the high carb group. And the high carb group and the low carb group were not different. So again, to me, if anything, this suggests that if you're normal weight, you're probably getting the best bang for your buck at kind of a balanced level of carbohydrate and fat intake. That if you go too extreme one way or the other, perhaps it's not as optimal. But all of that should be framed within the following context. Maintaining a lean body fat or a normal body weight is by far the biggest impact on insulin sensitivity and metabolic health. So if a low carb diet allows you to best do that, if you find that's easiest to stick to, then do that. If a high carb diet allows you to do that and stick to it, then do that. If you don't really find a difference between these different types of diets in terms of your adherence, then do what you prefer or maybe just do the balanced one since that appears to be a little bit better. But one thing this paper does suggest is it certainly doesn't support the idea 
that low carb is superior for insulin sensitivity, especially in people who are normal weight and who aren't undergoing weight loss. I think that's one of the things to point out is in dynamic weight loss studies where people are losing body fat. If you look at the long term, their markers of metabolic health and insulin sensitivity basically are the same in the long term if they lose the same amount of weight between like low carb and high carb diets. But in the short term, while they are undergoing dynamic changes in body weight, low carb may be a little bit better. In fact, there is some evidence that like fasting glucose, fasting insulin, HbA1c may reduce faster on a low carb diet during weight loss compared to a higher carb diet. What does that mean for long-term health outcomes? I don't think it means very much personally. I think again, we have to look at the long-term play. We need to get people at a lean body weight or a normal body weight, and that's gonna have the biggest bang for the buck. If you're somebody who likes low carb and you could do low carb and it makes weight loss easier for you or weight maintenance easier for you, hell yeah, do it. Absolutely. But just doing it or trying to force yourself to do it when you're having trouble adhering to it, but maybe you could adhere to a more balanced diet because you think that it's the best way to, you know, improve your insulin sensitivity or uh, reduce your HbA1c. Well, again, now you're stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. Again, focus on adherence first. And then if you don't find an difference between adherence in some of these different diets, then okay, maybe do low carb if you need to lose weight and you want to resolve your HbA1c faster. That's fine. But again, if you're somebody who finds it difficult to stick to a low carb diet, you do better on a balanced or high carb diet. On the long term, you're going to be better off on the diet that you can better adhere to. So again, I'm not dogging low carb diets. I'm just saying so many people have these diet wars. And the fact is so many different types of diets work for improving metabolic health and lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer just by getting you to a leaner body weight. And whatever allows you to do that is probably going to be the best diet for you, which is why our app, Carbon Diet Coach, does not try to pigeonhole you into any one type of diet. We give all different kinds of dietary preferences, including low-carb, ketogenic, low-fat, balanced, plant-based. You have your pick because at the end of the day, whatever facilitates the best adherence is going to be what's best for you as an individual. So you can check that out by clicking the link in the description, and I'll catch you guys next week.